You're listening to part three of The Nobody Zone, a podcast series in six parts, brought to you by RTE's Documentary on One in Ireland and Third Ear Productions in Denmark. My name is Tim Hinman. If you've not heard part one and part two yet, I'd suggest you stop right now and go back. Otherwise, what follows might not make any sense at all. You put yourself in my shoes, right? Yeah. You will kill the geezer. And years go by, and you do another few, right? And you're not captured. So what do you do? Think. What do you do then? Are you with me now? If you kept it banged to rights, you mean? Yeah, banged to rights. What do you do? What you're telling us then, it's been playing on your mind for some time. You then decide to come clean and tell us all the truth. Yeah. And that is right, is it? That's right. And that's what I do. Who did he murder or are you a spy? I'm just fond of a drink, helps me laugh, helps me cry. No, but just drink red biddy for a permanent high. I laugh a lot less, I cry till I die. So right out of the blue, I just said to him, now tell me about all the other murders, eh, Kelly? And he said, which one are you talking about? And I said, well, you just tell me. People picked up the story and they ran with it. How are you, Kelly? Do you want to come say? And that's where Kelly pushed most of his victims underneath the trains when they got to the edge of the railway platform. You can't live Without love alone. The proofs round the West End and nobody's own. In this episode, I want to separate a lot of truth from a lot of, well, things that are less than true. I want to do this to get to grips with the Kieran Kelly story, because at this point, there's a problem. It's hard to know what's true and what's not. Last time, we left journalist Robert Mulhern in the company of the author of the book The London Underground Serial Killer, former Metropolitan Police Officer Jeff Platt. I say, I'll shut up at a minute's notice. I'm not trying to bore you. No, 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 no. What happened was, sure. yeah, what actually happened about how Kelly came to be convicted? We were having trial after trial after trial after trial. We were there for months. After Boyd? I said, no, no, just, we just went trial after trial. This conversation has gone on a long, long time at this point. Um, the thing that started to really, that I, that I became very aware of the more this went on is that, you know, Jeff wasn't getting tired and it was like he was getting more energy as the interview went on and he shared these war stories from his career and I'm starting to look at my watch and I can see that we've been recording for nearly four hours at this point. This guy turns up, he's taken two policemen hostage, he's got shotguns in their mouths. He's uh, driving down the road doing uh, somewhere between 80 and 90 miles an hour. Turns up. And, um, yeah, so he levelled the shotgun at me. So I took his head off. 25 metres. So I'm trying to figure out a way of how I'm going to make my goodbyes or how I'm going to leave. And, you know, it strikes me that it's unusual that it's me who's looking for a way out of this interview at this point. The reason why Rob is looking to wriggle out of this interview, like someone trying to escape an awkward Tinder date, is that... Far from explaining the facts and making things clear, Jeff has thrown the whole Kelly story up in the air for Rob. Jeff Platt is in the habit of making somewhat grandiose claims and exaggerating rather a lot. The problem is that this has thrown the whole basis of his book, his version of the Kieran Kelly story, into doubt. Rob's just not sure anymore if he can trust a single word of what Jeff Platt is telling him. After a very long lunch, it's finally time for Rob to make his excuses and leave. I've a couple of projects on the go, but um, I'll, uh, once I get a chance to do a bit more research, then I'll give you a shout again and I'll, I'll spin up. We'll have another bit of lunch. And, yeah. But I mean, it's... Uh, not bad for five, is it? No, it's good. But no, it's great to talk to you, Jeff. 
No, as I said, I, 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 I tend to control myself and uh, try and restrain myself from uh, talking continuously. But uh, on the other hand, when, when somebody asks me to, uh, to come and talk to them, then yeah. you feel that uh, you're expected to speak a bit. So. <laughs> Well, listen. Yeah, we'll keep in touch. That's fine. Not yeah. a problem, sir. Okay, Jeff. You take care. Yeah. Okay, cheers, Jeff. Bye. The train home gives Rob a chance to try and make some sense of what Jeff Platt has told him so far. So I'm sitting on the train back to London and I'm thinking about all these things that Jeff has just told me about that don't really make sense. Jeff claims to have run the whole case. But then, earlier in the interview, he said he was a trainee detective. I mean, how would a trainee detective run a case on this scale that involved a cover-up and multiple deaths. He said there was trial after trial after trial and that Kelly kept getting found not guilty. But these were public trials, so how did that fit with a cover-up? Then there was this running total of murder victims. You know, starting at 12, then it went to 24, progressed steadily up to 31. But any time I asked Jeff, could he provide a list of names, he kind of dodged me or changed tack onto something else. But why couldn't he put this into an orderly list? The thing is, I know there's a thread of truth in Jeff Platt's story. So what exactly is that thread of truth? The revelations in Jeff Platt's book made headlines in 2015. They sailed completely unchallenged across all sorts of serious and what you might call respectable media channels. The story of Kieran Kelly, the London underground serial killer, and a possible cover-up by the Home Office made the BBC Today programme, the Huffington Post, newspapers like the Daily Telegraph, the Daily Express, the Irish Examiner, the Irish Post, the list goes on and on. The only newspaper to ask any critical questions to Jeff Platt was the Irish Daily Mail. They did some fact-checking, finding out, for example, that Platt had Kelly's date and place of birth wrong. They also found plenty of other discrepancies similar to those that Rob was confronted with in his conversations with Platt. To back his claims up, Jeff Platt said to the Irish Daily Mail that he knew of 20 public prosecutors over the last 30 years who had independently expressed the opinion that Kelly was guilty of multiple murders. But when they asked him for the names of any of these prosecutors, he said he hadn't made any notes. A credible voice, uh, an ex-detective who'd received commendations for his police work in his career. So people picked up the story and they ran with it. Now, if all Jeff Platt's claims are simply untrue, it might be easy enough to dismiss this entire story now as a bad case of fake news. And we could just stop here. But we do know that some of what Jeff is saying is true. We've heard the tapes. Tell us the truth about that one, and then we can then we can t- then we can clear the whole lot up. And what do you want me to tell you? Well, tell, tell us the truth. truth. Tell us the truth. I'm telling you the truth. You killed him. Yeah. We've heard Kieran Kelly confess to multiple killings. Just sit down and have a, have a quick count up in your own mind about the ones you think you have killed about the ones you think you might have killed and how many you're sure you're killed so how do we get to the bottom of this well we could imagine that this is a courtroom trial and we've got jeff platt as a witness we can take his testimony and deal with it in detail we can have a look at the claims he makes one by one We can start with the claim that he found a string of news articles going back many years that named Kieran Patrick Kelly as a witness to what looked like suicides on the tube. If you remember, last time, Jeff Platt said he found these articles in the archives of the South London Press. Well, what happened was that I went down to the offices of the local newspaper, the South London Press in Streatham. I looked through all the old newspapers for 30 years and I found a number of incidents where people had fallen in the tube trains. The interesting thing was that all of them had been talking to Kieran Kelly at the time. 
So I called the South London Press. This is now with a wall of newspapers. You start flicking through them and you start finding that uh, more and more deaths start coming to notice where Kim and Patrick Kelly has been standing there talking to people when they suddenly decide to launch themselves underneath the tube train. But the South London Press told me they didn't have that kind of archive. There was no wall of papers like Jeff Platt described. It seems there's no archive. Maybe they did have one back in 1983, but no one remembers that. In any case, let's examine Jeff's claim here. He says that Kieran Kelly was interviewed at the site of these alleged suicides by the police or by a reporter, and that this happened time after time, and that Kieran Patrick Kelly gave his full name, which later appeared in these articles. Now, of course, it's true that the local press often write about tragic events like these, but they're not really big news and reporters really don't usually get to the scene. If there's going to be an article, it's very unlikely to include an interview with a witness who claims to have seen it happen, and to name that witness by name. It could happen, but it's unlikely. Maybe more damning is the fact that Jeff Platt does not reproduce or refer to a single one of these articles specifically in his book. Basically, we've only got Jeff Platt's word that they ever existed. And that means that we also only have Jeff Platt's word that he confronted Kieran Kelly with what he found out in the archives of the South London Press. And that's why Kieran Kelly confessed to him about a whole new set of murders he hadn't yet revealed. The ones he committed by pushing random strangers in front of tube trains. Let's leave that one there and move on to the next thing. Jeff Platt's claimed that he was the only investigator on the case, even though he was only a trainee detective. Rob has to track down any available documents he can find. I'm just looking for court documents for uh, Akira and Patrick Kelly. Okay. I wonder could you point me in the right direction? Um, what sort of period would it have been? It's 75 to 85. So I get my hands on a whole bunch of court files. As I'm flicking over page after page, it strikes me that there's no sign of Jeff Platt's name anywhere on any document. He's not even recorded as a witness. Jeff Platt's name is not on any court papers Rob can find. So, while we're here with the court papers in front of us, Let's have a look at what actually did happen in court when Kieran Kelly was tried. It says inside that Kiernan Kelly, that's Kiernan spelt wrong, spelt with an N, was tried at Central Criminal Court, the Old Bailey, in 1984. There were two counts of murder. One was for the killing of Hector Fisher on Clapham Common in 1975. Fisher. That's the murder Kelly confessed to, to the surprise of the police at the time, when he was being interviewed about killing William Boyd in the cells at Clapham Police Station. Would you tell me again how you did him? I did him a wallop. I'm not sure. But I cut his bugs, but... How many times did you stab him? I don't know. He's also charged here, of course, with the murder of William Boyd in the cells at Clapham Police Station. Wait, is that why you did Boyd, to, to start clearing the books? No, no. No way. No way. Why did you do him? Huh? Why did you do him? There are no trials for any other murders in 1983 or 1984 in the records. So now we can come to Jeff Platt's claim of a Home Office cover-up. They decided that it was in the public interest not to broadcast the story. They felt that uh, people who heard this story may start to panic, people wouldn't want to use the underground. Jeff Platt's list of 31 killings does not figure in any of the records here. So that would match with a cover-up story, if it's true. So, either there was a cover-up, as Jeff describes it, or there's another explanation. I'll leave that there for now because there is some other very useful information in the court records. Other names. Names of people still alive who knew Kieran Kelly and who were involved with him during his arrest and trial. One of the names on the court documents is Kelly's defending solicitor, a man called John Slater. Hi. 
Hi, John. How are you? I'm okay, thanks. Good. John Slater is still practicing criminal law, and Rob tracked him down to his office. You're younger than I expect. <laughs> you must have been very young back in fairly 19, young, yes. 1983. Fairly young. It turns out that even after so many years, John Slater has a clear memory of Kieran Patrick Kelly. My main recollection is the incredible way in which I found him as a client. Uh, it would never happen nowadays. Um, I was the duty solicitor at South Western Magistrates Court and he suddenly got presented to me as a client, brought into the room. There was no security worth calling. I mean, it, the room was locked and I was there with him and I said, uh, what are you charged with? Oh, attempted murder. Slater was assigned by the court to defend Kelly in a case of attempted murder. That was in 1982. 1982 was the year before he killed William Boyd in the police cells. The case of the attempted murder at Tooting Beck uh, tube station where he was alleged to have pushed someone under a tube. Now that does sound a lot like the story Jeff Platt is telling in his book. Kelly, the London Underground serial killer. So is Jeff Platt right after all? He was acquitted of that offence. Kelly was found not guilty of the attempted murder of a man called Francis Taylor. Francis Taylor didn't die, so he's not a murder victim. Here's what Jeff Platt said to Rob about the Francis Taylor case. There was one murder that took place, the Francis murder, that he was accused of. It was witnessed by a doctor, a lawyer and an accountant. Unfortunately, he got away with it, despite three good professional witnesses all giving evidence that he'd done it. Um, and with Kelly's solicitor at the time, would they have, like, obviously he had a defence and people making a case on his behalf, did they just claim that this was a suicide? Well, that's the interesting thing, isn't it? I mean, Kelly was represented by the same solicitor whilst 31 murders were alleged against him. But Francis Taylor wasn't murdered, he survived. So that's at least one name to take off the list of 31 dead, you'd assume. You, I'm just thinking, you know, imagine that you're the solicitor. You've defended this man against 31 allegations. Imagine that you're the solicitor. Well, John Slater doesn't have to imagine anything. He was Kelly's solicitor. It was an unusual case. I, I mean, you only get a case of this nature once in your professional career. I mean, I've had several murder cases, but I don't think I've ever before or since had a multiple murder case. Slater did not represent Kelly for charges of 31 killings, as Jeff Platt says. Only two. Well, it was initially the matter of the uh, murder in the um, Clapham police station. And subsequently, he was also charged, of course, with the murder of Fisher on Clapham Common. Uh, those were the two cases I represented him in. Slater knew Kelly well. Kelly was a reliable source of work. I didn't actually dislike the bloke. Um, I mean, he obviously was up to no good. Um, but it's very much easier to deal with people who are hardened criminals, frankly, um, who don't really expect to go anywhere other than to prison. And what about Jeff Platt's book? And now Jeff Platt's version of events, do you have an awareness of his book or have you read the book or...? Yes, I have read the book. I mean, I think it was... It wasn't the most riveting of <laughs> reads, I must say. And I don't think he had the detailed knowledge. I got the distinct impression that uh, he had got a lot of it out of archives. At the same time, that on its own doesn't mean that he's wrong. No, no, of course it doesn't mean that he's wrong. Um, what I do find surprising is that uh, someone who I would describe as a bag carrier who was not involved in a senior position within the inquiry should take it upon themselves to write a book about it and try and carry the weight as if he was one of the principal characters in it. 
And obviously the assertion that the Home Office tried to quell details of these stories on the underground because they wanted to um, offset some kind of national panic. I don't buy that. So, John Slater does not believe in any cover-up by the Home Office. He certainly doesn't know about any, and he hasn't heard about any cover-up. More than that, in John Slater's opinion, Jeff Platt was nothing more than a bag carrier on the Kelly case. But Slater wasn't working the police side of the Kelly case, of course, and he wouldn't have known who did what during the investigation on Kelly. If anyone should know what Jeff Platt's role really was, then that really ought to be the man in charge of the investigation. It was Detective Inspector Brown. There is a name that does feature prominently on the court documents, the then Detective Inspector Ian Brown. We met Ian Brown before, of course, in episode one. Ian Brown is the man who made the interview tapes with Kelly alongside his superior officer, Ray Adams. Identify yourself, sir. Detective Chief Superintendent Adams in the presence of Detective Inspector Brown. When Rob caught up with him, the first thing he wanted to know was how Jeff Platt fitted into the Kelly investigation. And just to clarify again, Ian, you were a lead investigator on the, the original case with Boyd in the station, and what was Jeff Platt's role as a Metropolitan Police Officer through that period? I don't remember Jeff Platt. He was a aid to CID, in other words, an apprentice detective. So he was a PC, a police constable, out of uniform, uh, patrolling the streets and trying to learn his, his task. I understand that he never, ever made detective. So, Jeff Platt never was a detective in the Metropolitan Police. But if Jeff Platt was involved in the Kelly case, what exactly did he do? Jeff Platt was employed to run Kelly from Brixton Prison to the Old Bailey or to all his court appearances. Now, I've no doubt that during that time, Jeff Platt talked to Kelly a lot. In actual fact, he did get a commendation on that case uh, for his work in relation to Kelly after his arraignment. So, Jeff Platt did know Kieran Kelly, that's true. He did spend time with him, as he said, driving him to and from court. And Jeff Platt was even given a commendation for his work on the Kieran Kelly case. But what about his claims to have been the only investigating officer? Or his claim to have been in the room when Kelly confessed? You were in a room when two senior detectives interviewed him. That's right, yes. Yes. And he then confessed to what? He confessed to 16 murders, including the one that he just committed in the cell. There were maybe 10 interviews in all of Kelly, uh, and Jeff Platt was never present in any one of them. He had absolutely no connection to the investigation, to the interviews, and there's things in the book that says he sat there with a tape recorder, uh, hidden so that Kelly didn't know it was there. That's one of the many claims that Jeff Platt has made, which are totally untrue. Totally untrue, says Ian Brown. So how much information did Brown provide for Jeff Platt's book? Did he speak to you prior to publication, or when's the last conversation you had with Jeff Platt? I, I've never had a conversation with Jeff Platt. Um, uh, the crazy part is that I got a phone call saying... Have you seen the headlines in the paper? And I saw this story of the London underground killer, murderer, mass murderer. And I thought, that's strange. I thought I did that one. And then I found that, that oh, so many things that just didn't add up about the claims not only in relation to the Kelly murder, but uh, the claims of what he did in the, in the police force. His claims of his career are just fanciful. They are 
impossible for somebody to achieve in the time frame of, of, of his career. So, if we're still going along with the idea that Jeff Platt is on the stand and this is some sort of a trial, I think we can say that his testimony has now been fairly thoroughly cross-examined. And I think we can stop here. Not much more I can say about it, really, other than the, to, uh, the claims of 30, 40, 50 murders is yet again a piece of uh, Jeff Platt fantasy. How much of his book is just what Ian Brown calls Jeff Platt fantasy? Well, it seems there's nothing much to back up many, if not all, of his claims. Slater doesn't buy the idea of a cover-up by the Home Office, and neither does Ian Brown. There were not 31 victims. Jeff Platt was not present during Kelly's interviews. He had no significant part in the investigation and has invented other things about his career in the police force. It's safe to say that Jeff Platt has proved himself to be an unreliable source. So, this means we also have to disregard his claim that Kelly opened up to him about being a suppressed homosexual who killed people out of fear of discovery and then continued to kill because he was addicted to the rush. We have to disregard all of it. Even the title of his book is way off, The London Underground Serial Killer, as it seems that only one victim died in the underground after being pushed in front of a train. But it is still thanks to Jeff Platt that we've even heard about Kieran Kelly. And we do know that Kelly did admit to a lot of killings. Ian Brown says it himself. In the end, Kelly put his hands up to maybe 13, 14, 15 murders. So, to be fair, it's time to let Jeff Platt speak in his own defence. Rob sets up another meeting. There was always going to be that second meeting. Hello, Jeff. But I always wanted that second meeting to take place when I felt I'd you know, a broader sense of the Kelly story and spoken to lots of other people. Hiya, Jeff. Rob Mulhern here. How are you doing? Good, thanks, Jeff. I just wanted to... It was at this point that Rob had just found out the reason why Jeff Platt was so hard to get hold of for all those months, back when he first tried to contact him. It turns out that Jeff Platt has just been in prison. He was convicted of dangerous driving after a road rage offence where he lost his temper. He asked me if I wanted to come to Stoke to do the second interview. At that point, I didn't want to go to Stoke because I knew that I was going to challenge Jeff on very basic elements of the story, but my instinct at that point was that he may react badly to being challenged on it. I didn't want to be in his house in Stoke in a confined space, so I wanted to have some control over what way this conversation went down and how we handled it. So we can meet outside Clapham Common Station. We'll, uh, we'll see you there tomorrow. Instead of meeting in Jeff Platt's sitting room, Rob has chosen to meet him on Clapham Common in London, at the site of the brutal murder of Hector Fisher. Jeff! Hi, Jeff. How are you? Not bad, not bad. We walk down through this winding footpath towards the church where Hector Fisher had been murdered. Down to the yeah, common. Yes, yes, yes. We got down to the church and, you know, we, we kind of got into it very, very quickly and I just introduced some areas where there was conflict in the story. So in the last couple of weeks I've met with John Slater and Ian Brown and, and spoken to them kind of extensively about the case. And there's a lot of variance in what they have to say and what you have to say. Um, in respect of the of the Kelly case, okay, and Ian Brown has copies of the recordings of the original Kelly interviews, but you weren't in the interview room in the station, according to Ian Brown. He said it was him and Ray Adams, and that you weren't even in the station at that time. You came in later and got a commendation for your legwork, but all these individuals say you weren't in present in the interview room. I wasn't present during the main interview, I grant you that, yeah, okay. Doesn't mean I don't know the facts. As I say, I spent 
I spent more time than they did actually investigating the case and everything like that. So I spent time with Kelly, I spent time chasing up all the facts and everything like that. Jeff is beginning to realise that this interview isn't going the same way as the first time around. It's like he knows something is off with the line of questioning. And I was just going back through some of my notes and you told me a number of times that you were the only person alive who knew Kelly. I think so. But obviously Ian Brown knew him and obviously John Slater knew him personally. And they're both still alive. His, his kind of feet start shifting uneasily underneath him and he's fidgeting with his hand in his pocket and, you know, pulling the zipper on his coat. People would get uncomfortable, Jeff, in terms of some of these points that when you present a case of such magnitude and such importance that I guess the public would expect uh, a kind, the kind of rigour that has been absent there, they would expect extensive conversations with Brown and Adams. Okay. Okay, well, I'm sorry, just and then he leans yeah. down and, and picks up a bag. He turns with the bag and like starts heading away. Jeff? Are we not having a conversation anymore, Jeff? Jeff? Not in the direction of the train station first. It's, it's almost like he doesn't know where he's walking. Jeff, are those questions not fair? He cuts across the grass at a common, and I mean, it's, it's autumn, so all these leaves have fallen off the trees. Jeff? And he starts kind of walking through these leaves. He's not even on the footpath. Jeff, can I just get two more minutes? Will you just hear me out, Jeff? It's, it's like I've really thrown him off road with these questions I've been asking him. And then he realises after about 50 steps that he's walking in the wrong direction and he turns on his heels and heads back in the direction of Clapham Common Station. We're finished. Why? You know, I'm chasing after him, but... Why, Jeff? Are they not fair questions? It's like I'm not there. Jeff, I'm going to ask you one more question now and then I'll leave you alone. But Jeff, obviously, obviously this sounds bad. So there's an opportunity to clarify it. This, this is going to sound bad and this is going to reflect badly on yourself. That's the last thing I'll say. You have a position to, to chat to me still. He won't even look to acknowledge where the questions are, are coming from. He just has tunnel vision. It's like all that's in his head is, I'm getting to this station. And when he gets there, he disappears down the steps and into the noise of the underground. And that was the last time I ever saw Jeff Platt. There's a strange kind of numbers game going on in this story. Numbers go up and they go down. But those numbers refer to people's lives, to murder victims. We can put Jeff Platt's tally of 31 murder victims down to exaggeration what Ian Brown called Jeff Platt fantasy. But if you ask me, there was never any reason to exaggerate anything at all about the Kieran Kelly story. Even if there never was a London underground serial killer, Kelly was a brutal murderer. He was a serial killer. Ian Brown says himself that Kelly stood up to 13, 14 or 15 murders. It's the real story of Kieran Patrick Kelly that we should be looking at here. Because sometimes truth is just far better than fiction. Next time on The Nobody Zone. All you young people, now take my advice. Before crossing the ocean, you'd better think twice. Because you can't live without love, without love alone. Proofs round the west end in the nobody's home But the summer is fine but the winter's a fridge Wrapped up in old cardboard in the cherry cross bridge And they'll never go home now because of the shame Of a misfit's reflection in a shower The Nobody's Own is written and narrated by Tim Hinman. 
storyline and production is by Tim Hinman and Krista Molson. Original idea, research and recordings are by Robert Mulhern, Ronan Kelly and Liam O'Brien, with production assistance from Sarah Blake, Donal O'Hurley, Tim Desmond, Nicolene Greer and Michael Lawless. Original music for the series is by Tim Hinman. The title music is the song Missing You performed by Christy Moore. Graphics marketing and press by John Kilkenny, Laura Beatty, Amy O'Driscoll, Nigel Wheatley, Frederick Neilbo, Jilly McDonough, Ellen Leonard, Bren Murphy and Dana Joyce. Illustrations by Alex Williamson. The Nobody Zone is a collaboration between RTE's documentary on one in Ireland and third year productions in Denmark. If you wish to join the social media conversation around this podcast, please use hashtag the Nobody Zone or visit rte.ie forward slash the Nobody Zone. And if you'd like to comment or share any information you might have on the story, we'd love to hear from you. Email us documentaries at rte.ie. Until next time. Thanks for listening.